On this episode of China Unscripted, what the Chinese regime is learning from Russia's invasion of Ukraine, why American communications and even the power grid are at risk, and how India is reacting to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And it's not how you would think. Welcome to China Unscripted. I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. And joining us once again is Cleo Pascal. She's a non-resident senior fellow for the Indo-Pacific at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and she's on the Global Counterterrorism Council. Cleo, it's great to have you back on again. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to be there, and I'm going to ask the question all viewers have been wanting to know for a very long time now, which is, is that a real brick wall? Oh. D- does it look like a real wall? It's a real wall. It, 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 <laughs> yeah, Matt, Matt is 100% correct. It is a real wall, just like you asked. Okay. <laughs> so moving on to the very important interview, <laughs> getting off topics. Is it uh, as historically accurate as the Great Wall of China then? Is it the, the Great Wall of China and script? I, I would argue it's it's more historically accurate than the great the part of the Great Wall of China that you go visit as a tourist. Certainly the part that I went to where you get there and then you come down and they try to sell you like T-shirts with Mao Zedong on them the way that Mao would have wanted. Wait, hold on. Are you saying the, that wall isn't real? Uh, it was barely real. It was so restored. Was it Beidai He? I forget exactly which part I went to. But it, the no, part Beidai He. Bada, Badaling. Badaling. Beidai He is like the, the communist beach, party the resort. The beach resort, yeah. If you were there, I'd be jealous. <laughs> uh, no, you wouldn't. I'd be in I'd be in a black jail. Uh, but the, that, that part of that wall, the Great Wall that I visited, was so restored, like in the past 20 years, and this was 2002 when I went there, but it was so well restored that it could not have possibly resembled at all what had been there before. But you said it was not a real wall. Is it, well, it was functioning a, as a wall? It was functioning as a wall. Then I mean, therefore it is a real wall. It obviously wall. didn't keep the Manchus out. Did they have a bunch of- How many Manchus did you see that day, Matt? Uh, no, I didn't see any because they're all- Well, wrong. how about that? <laughs> Looks like the wall's working. Well, and that answers your question, Cleo, about our, our wall, which as you can see uh, is brick shaped. I, I, yep. I, I won't ask about the plants then either. <laughs> yep, they're definitely there. <laughs> yeah. All the, right. The, the, the only thing that's real is the uh, the actual helmet that Chris wore uh, in Hong Kong in 2014 during the Umbrella Movement. That's that's a big deal. Yeah. And I would say, and the news, you are real news, and uh, so that's uh, increasingly rare. So. Uh, ah. Oh well, thank you. Thank you. Ooh, Anyways, cool. war for Ukraine. <laughs> is that where we're going first? <laughs> that, that's that's one hundred percent where we're going first. So, because that's that's the thing everyone is talking about. In particular, like the focus is on how the West has responded or should respond to Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, or China's response. But what usually gets lost in this is is how India is responding because India really isn't can't be considered the same as like the West. But neither is it a part of the, you know, Russia-China authoritarian alliance. So since, you know, you have your expertise on India, what's, how are they positioning themselves? So I'm I'm not, no, I don't think, uh, it's very hard to be uh, an expert on India. So all I can do is kind of tell you what I'm hearing from the, from the Indian media. Um, And they are, uh, viewing this, especially their strategists and what you hear online, very, very differently than what we're seeing in, in the West. And I think, uh, you know, th- this is, this comes on a, a long line of, um, the, the last two years have created an enormous amount of distrust in Western n- narratives and reporting and what, are, what have been considered reliable global institutions. Um, and we definitely saw it around COVID. So if you ask people what they think about the WHO now versus two and a half years ago, it will be very different, and especially in a place like India, where they had a completely different approach in many cases to dealing with COVID. So they had the vaccines, but they also had these um, preventative packs that got distributed throughout UP, for example, that seems to have been very effective, but wasn't widely reported on. Their scientists had a different assessment of the origin um, that was not what was being reported in The Lancet, for example. Um, 
uh, the, the reporting around the Delta variant initially, which was initially the Indian variant, which seemed to have a political warfare quality to it, was very, very different. So th- there's, there has started to be a, uh, an overt breakdown in uh, trust uh, with Indian policymakers and the Indian public with Western uh, narratives. So that comes into this situation because, you know, while the Indian government has been very clear, don't invade other countries, that's bad, we don't approve, Uh, this is a humanitarian crisis, all that stuff. What they're saying is also, now let's talk about what's going on in Afghanistan as well, because you've got uh, Taliban going door to door, shooting people who they say were collaborating with the Americans, and that's not getting reported you have a humanitarian crisis that's that's enormous. You have uh, people who are being uh, killed and displaced and raped and incarcerated, and there's there's nothing about that. So yeah, we yes we care about the people of Ukraine, uh, of course, and we'd also like you to care about some of some of this other stuff because um, the and and you hear this openly in the Indian media, the perception is that this is a a white person's war. This is in Ukraine. This is a a European security concern. And, and there, there were, I, it's hard to, you know, there was a lot of, it's hard to know how much of it is organic and I would expect a lot of it would be. Uh, But there's also a bit of a almost political warfare component to it. And we saw that at the, at the beginning, uh, there was the this refugee crisis. People were trying to leave Ukraine, and Ukraine has a lot of international students. And there was footage being widely circulated online in the Middle East and also in India and Africa and elsewhere of people who were not white being quite violently pushed away from the borders by what was said to be Ukrainian border guards. And the way that this was uh, presented and again, remember, I'm talking about perceptions in this context, perception is very important, was that um, that they wanted to keep, uh, for in this case, for example, the Indians in Ukraine so that they would get killed by Russians so that they would turn anti-Russia. That's the way that narrative was being spun. Hmm. Um, and, and they had about 20,000 Indians caught in Ukraine. And the Indian government made it a priority to get them out. It was called Operation Ganga. They sent government ministers. They sent the Indian military. It was a massive operation that uh, was made possible because of the cooperation, ultimately, of the Ukrainian side, but also of the Russian side. Um, and so while the Ukraine reportedly the Ukrainians wanted the Indians to evacuate via a much longer route, but which would have kept them out of Russia, Russia was saying, you're perfectly welcome to come through Russia and leave from Russia. And the, the Russian uh, envoy to the UN actually said, you know, we, we want to help the Indians leave. And you had a situation where uh, people from other countries not in, not, who were not Indian citizens were putting Indian flags or claiming they were Indian because they knew the Indian government was working to get everybody out. And they got everybody out except for the one student that died. And uh, the Russians are saying, don't worry, we'll have an inquiry into what happened. So that was what was all over the news in, in, in India was um, we're getting help from the Russians and the Ukrainians to get our people out. And then the social media thing of the Ukrainians are racist, being racist against our people and, and for their own reasons, putting our people in harm's way. The, the, Re- ground reality, I'm not reporting. I have no idea what the ground reality was. But that was a very, very dominant um, way that it was being presented in the Indian media. And it feeds into this whole, you can't trust the Western coverage of this situation, just like you couldn't trust it on COVID. Um, you know, there's all these other things going on. And so it's cr- where there were starting to be these fractures. Uh, they're now really breaking very, very wide. Um, I mean, I can, can go into the implications for the quad and things like that, but it is, uh, the situation in Ukraine is horrible and tragic. 
and the geopolitical fallout, uh, it, it, and unless managed, is uh, cascading uh, in a very disconcerting direction. When you say that there's a political warfare component to this, can you elaborate on that? Yes. Yeah, so uh, every, everybody is trying to win hearts and minds in their own way. And um, Zelensky, for example, you know, he's fighting for the survival of his country and for his people. And it's completely legitimate for him to use whatever mechanisms he can. And so, and they've been very good at it. Um, they understand their audience. So, going, you know, they'll, they'll talk to the Germans about how another Holocaust is happening or talk to the U.S. Congress about this is another 9-11 or, you know, they, you know they're, they're, they're doing what they need to do to try to save their people. So is everybody else. I mean, from from their own positions. Um, and uh, in in the case of Russia, identifying this issue with the students was uh, a big a big one. And uh, and also, the India Russia relationship is very complicated, uh, and there are highs and lows. But there are a lot of the highs that are being re-emphasized. So, um, well, they get a lot of military equipment from Russia, correct? Yeah, I, right. And at important times. So, so what's come out now, for example, is that during Galwan, um, Russia was sending in plane loads of weapons daily. That was the conflict between China and India on the border. Just for clarification. That's right. And this, and this is extremely important for India because India is concerned that uh, China will take a look at what's happening in Ukraine plus what happened in Afghanistan plus the, the lack of international response to Hong Kong and go, you know what, now's a good time to try to go for Taiwan. And they, what, they, what they don't want to happen is China to go, oh, and maybe India or maybe we'll knock out India first and then go for Taiwan. And in, in that context, if China thinks that the India-Russia relationship is such that Russia would stay at least neutral in that case, then that's advantage India. So you have uh, a situation where at the UN Security Council vote, three countries abstained. China abstained on, on U Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, China India and UAE. And it was all for different reasons. And the response in Moscow was very different. I think they were disappointed in the Chinese for abstaining and not backing them. But they were pleasantly surprised at the Indians abstaining and not voting against them. And the, and the UAE, similarly, that whole Russia Middle East thing is uh, also fast evolving. And uh, there are a lot of the same rationale that went into what I just talked about in terms of the uh, response in India is also true in the Middle East. There were student Middle Eastern students who on social media were saying that they were being um, uh, discriminated against in, a, in an overtly racist way by Ukrainian security personnel. And U Ukraine... Uh, voted against, did not support India on the Kashmir issue. Ukraine, India was the, one of the first countries to recognize an independent Ukraine, but Ukraine castized, castigated India for this, for the nuclear tests. So all of these things are, are brought out. I'm sure you can find lots of positive things, but through this, the question was political warfare. Through this uh, mechanism of trying to justify these decision-making, you, you People are very selective. So in the case of, of India, Russia, you get you go back to the to the Bangladesh War of Independence, where um, the Seventh Fleet sailed up into the Bay of Bengal and it was shadowed shadowed by the Soviets and that sort of thing. I mean, I haven't heard I, I haven't heard more mention of the USS Enterprise outside of a Star Trek convention than I have in the last few weeks on Indian TV. That was sort of the lead carrier ship in the in the battle group and it they it keeps getting brought up what they don't bring up are things like 
Indian Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri dying mysteriously in Tashkent or, you know, all the all the negative sides of, of the relationship. Um, because for for India, this is this war is really, really bad. High oil prices will uh, trash their economy and they have a very young population. And if their economy craters, and it was already very fragile because of COVID, then you have a lot of unemployed youth, which makes them very ripe for radicalization of all sorts. It's also very bad for the quad. And that's why when you had this quad meeting uh, and President Biden was uh, reportedly trying to encourage a statement about Ukraine, India was saying, Quad is about the Indo-Pacific and it's about China. It, if you bring Ukraine into this, it, this may not be the grouping for us. They want to keep the focus very much on China. So this sounds like there's a lot of complicated uh, geopolitical factors going on. Like India obviously can would not like Russia's invasion because that might encourage China to do some kind of invasion. However, it also seems like India wants to keep in the good graces of Russia to protect them from a possible Chinese invasion. And at the same time, China must be happy that this is driving a wedge between India and the other members of the Quad that then benefits China. So there's so many conflicting, uh, what's, what's the word? It's, it's complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. I like, I like everything in, you know, black and white, clear terms, ones and zeros. It's just, you're making this really hard for me. Yeah, this is uh, yeah, and there's a lot of uh, a lot of you know if X go to you know line six where you just kind of repeat and repeat and repeat, you know it's like okay if, if we do this then you end up in this dead end or you end up in this dead end and it's not and it, and in the case of India it's they're not just concerned about Chinese uh, encroachment on their territory but also Pakistan encroachment on their territory mm-hmm. you know so which brings in this whole kind of Sino Wahhabi element which gets brought up in Indian strategic communities as well. Um, so yes, it is incredibly complex. Uh, throughout it all, the the people of Ukraine are suffering tremendously. Um, and in the case of India, they're concerned about that uh, expanding, cascading and compounding in ways that will create very serious uh, insecurity across the Indo-Pacific. And um, Chris, you brought up this issue of about China being happy about potentially a wedge between India and the Quad. And you're starting to see different signaling about India in the Chinese media. So mm-hmm. uh, you know, a piece appeared recently saying that maybe it was a mistake to have the Chinese military hero of Galwan be a torchbearer during the uh, Olympic ceremony. You know, maybe, maybe we should, you know, try to keep India uh, at least neutral. So that old, that old kind of thing of you know, Nixon wanting to use China against the Soviet Union, you know, now you're seeing it with at least four or five different moving parts trying to do that. You know, you, you have the West, which may or may not be a monolithic bloc. You have the Middle East, you have India, you have China, you have Russia. You also have parts of Africa. Um, so, you know, they're, they're, everybody's trying to figure out, um, there's the contained, so far contained military component of it, the kinetic warfare, but there's this whole larger kind of global political warfare you know, it's World War II in a political warfare sense. And a lot of the elements in there are trying to uh, ensure that it doesn't become, you know, global in a kinetic sense from their own perspective. And there's a, an enormous amount of anger at the West for mismanagement. Uh, you know, not only first COVID, global financial crisis, and now this. I'm sorry these are long answers, but this is... <laughs> There, like you said, Shelley, a lot of moving parts here. Or no, Chris said, yeah, sorry, whoever. 
So my question is, what is Russia's interest in India? Because obviously, like what they did with the students, they see some kind of advantage to keeping India on their side. Yeah, so there, there are multiple reasons. Uh, India is a country of over a billion people. It's a massive market. It's uh, it, it, it allows Russia to hedge to a certain degree against China. And if we're talking about the development of a parallel economic system, then you want India to be part of it. So mm -hmm. India has now talked about and I think it probably will buy heavily discounted Russian oil, uh, it, probably in a rupee ruble swap. So there's this, it's part of this major abandonment of the dollar of the, of the Western economic system. And India is saying, you want to sanction us? Go right ahead. We, we know how much you need us, especially in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, that's really interesting because We've known for a long time that you know China and Russia are trying to create a, a financial system that is impervious to Western sanctions, particularly U.S. sanctions. But they rely on the U.S. dollars. Right. However, I mean, something like ninety percent of international trade is the money is converted to U.S. dollars before being switched then into that third currency. But if they are able to get India, a population of a billion people, on on board with whatever alternate system they have, then that's pretty significant. I it is, but I don't know that you can get India and China on the same system. What if they all just use the Chinese digital yuan? Well, that's the problem. Will India want to take yuan? Maybe for some kind of guarantee uh, on the border from China, backed up by Russia. They that would, could be. They, they wouldn't trust them. I mean, they probably they, yeah. not. <laughs> they've they've lived in the same neighborhood for long enough to to know that that they wouldn't trust them on that. But it does. But from a from a U.S. perspective. They don't even have to have one competing system. It can just be all of these dollars, all of these trades pulled out of the U.S. system, and it could be rupee ruble, for example, hmm. which is, I, I think, actually what they're proposing doing for the S-400 system, ultimately, because then it may not, it, the idea was it wouldn't trigger the CATSA sanctions because it wasn't a trade being done in U.S. dollars. And, mm -hmm. and you know, there's this, this whole thing about, what are these sanctions for? You know, are they deterrent? And, uh, I've, you know, I've heard the Indians said, well, if you're sanctioning for the sake of deterrence, it didn't work at all. Hmm. And um, I don't, you know, I, and if you continue to do the deterrence in, in that way, uh, more of us may start to get very concerned about having our money in your systems. And this is apparently an element of the sanctions bill that's, that's before Biden is that they can just unilaterally decide anybody at any time should be sanctioned. And this is in a, in a macro way, sort of what happened in a minor way with the trucker protest in Canada, where they started freezing bank accounts at a, at a very low level. So somebody contributed $50 or $100 to the convoy when it was legal and then suddenly found their bank accounts frozen. And there was that overt statement by, by somebody in the government, I think it was the attorney generals, when they were asked about it, saying, well, if you're a Trump supporter and you donate 100000 or million or whatever, you should be worried. So that was a direct linkage to a kind of political position and um, this economic canceling, so to speak. Uh, it's, a so, it's a social credit type system right? Where you control behavior. And because in the case of the truckers, it was not clear whether it was legal or not legal. In fact, we had one of the, the last surviving premier who was a signatory to the charter was in the process of suing the government saying the mandates were illegal. And I mean, he wrote the charter. This would be like one of the founding fathers sort of saying, yeah, what you're doing, that's, that's, that's not what we wanted in, in the law. And and he went and spoke in front of the uh, protesters. And under this, under the Emergency Act, it's unclear whether that would be a justification for him to have his bank accounts frozen. So the guy who made the sanctions would be sanctioned. Yeah. Well, and well, yeah, and, sanctioned. Well, bank account and, frozen. Yeah. And this is very much the Chinese system, which within China, which is 
it's a gray zone. You don't know when you cross the line. So the goal is to keep you very far back from the line. That's the case, you know, you self-censor out of fear of not knowing where the line is. And so India's concern is that, you know, the Biden administration has criticized India for a variety of issues. There's human rights issues. The concern is that they might find themselves on the wrong end of some kind of U.S. sanctions as well. Yeah. And, and also individuals. I mean, and this goes back to the political warfare thing. Putin made a speech where he talked about people, Russians who had their, you know, fancy houses in Miami or, or whatever. And it, it's basically saying few have your property there and it gets seized you know don't blame us it's because you weren't you know loyal enough but the implicit threat is if you have any of your assets in those locations they're vulnerable to seizure so um and again i'm not i'm not this isn't a right or wrong or whether sanctions should continue to be applied or whatever i'm describing how this is being uh received and perceived within some sectors of the Indian strategic community and how that's affecting decision making. And the effect is maybe we shouldn't be investing in the U.S. because we'll get sanctioned. And so that those are not secure assets. And that that's at an individual level. Uh, and that's at a macro level. And we know from the case of the, again, from the truckers protests, uh, there's very sh- strong anecdotal evidence that some serious American investors and global investors are thinking m- more than once about whether or not to invest in Canada. And, hmm. um, and that may have been one of the reasons why the emergency act was pulled out because the, because money was, you know, the banks were saying they're going to close accounts and they're going to take the money and they're going to leave. So, you know, this, this, um, this reaction, this canceling at a macro level geopolitically, uh, is being perceived in a very different way in, with different audiences at, you know, as is this conflation between the population and the leadership. So, you know, Facebook saying it's okay to, you know, talk about violence against Russians if it's in the context of Ukraine, but at least opening that door because Putin's a bad guy um, also makes, makes people very nervous because we've been very clear, all of us have been very clear for a long time, for example, in the case of China, the Chinese Communist Party is not the Chinese people. Right. And the Chinese people are the biggest victims of the Chinese Communist Party. But now we're but now the dominant narrative is collective guilt for Russia, for Russians. So this is uh, not this is being perceived in, in a lot of places, not just India, but definitely in India as a very, very dangerous time for uh, for countries that are trying to figure out where they can fit within this uh, U.S.-led paradigm for international relations and the reali- their geopolitical reality, which may be a little bit more complex. Is there a way for the U.S. to manage that situation with India, do you think? Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but the question is, what is the what is the primary strategic goal? So um, is it just, is it to destroy Putin at any cost necessary? Uh, Is it to consider Putin the immediate threat and China the longer term threat? But I've I've heard uh, people say, people like Grant Newsham, who's been on your show, there's no point going after Russia if if you don't go after China also, because China is facilitating Russian activity. And I think things like going after Russia, would, uh, going after China would be very welcome in India. So if you're, if you're kind of willing to get to the root of those problems, uh, which the Indians are very clear, China is a huge problem, China is their main problem, uh, then you would certainly get a, a lot more buy-in in that case. Also, if you would 
acknowledge what's going on in Afghanistan and uh, see whether there's any way of mitigating some of some of that damage. That that would also be uh, that would not only add legitimacy, but it would help with what is uh, a horrible humanitarian situation that's just appalling. Because the perception is that the U.S. abandoned Afghanistan, and that by any ally of the U.S. could also face the same kind of abandonment. Uh, yes. Well, so so again, just repeating what I hear as the rationale on on the in the Indian strategic community. It's, I mean, it's not just them; it's also the Kurds. I mean, you, there's a whole list that gets brought up, but in but in the specific case of Afghanistan. Uh, the, the reporting that is getting into India about the brutality of the Taliban, I mean, it's why would we be surprised, uh, is, is horrific. And there were, there, was new, there were news reports coming out of the BBC and French media and various European media about how tragic it is to see these blonde, <laughs> blue-eyed white people in this refugee situation. And they were saying, you know, it's something you'd expect in the third world or, you know, this isn't Iraq or whatever. Well, if you're Indian the, the, and, you're, and you're reducing compassion to physiology, then the people who look like them to a certain degree are the ones in Afghanistan. And those are the, those are the you know, women that are being raped and the guys that are being shot and the, um, kids that are, can't go to school anymore. And so, um, it, it, unless there is a democratization, a perceived democratization of compassion, uh, then, um, then it's perceived as hypocrisy. Well, this is, this is definitely a lot more complicated than what you'll hear on like CNN or Fox. Yeah. And, and, and interestingly, what you're starting to find is a, a, a lot more interest in Indian media. Again, you know, they have their, their, their reality is I'm, I'm not talking about what should happen uh, and reiterating, don't invade other countries. That's bad. Uh, but understanding the complexities of the operating environments of other countries is a way of getting at um, I would say a more viable coalition that can perhaps effectively achieve the results that, that we want to achieve. And what we're seeing is what I'm seeing is a lot more people turning to Indian media. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I, I get more people sending me links from Indian media these days than I did definitely before the pandemic. Do you, have you seen any uptick in that or is it just people know I'm interested? So they send it to me. I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen nearly as much, but I mean, that's, what's interesting is that the media in the U.S. is kind of, you know, largely limited to the left and the right going by the U.S. linear political spectrum. Which, just to interject real quick, is insane because what it really is is the five mega corporations that own all the media. Right. So, I mean, even Fox News and CNN are not like super different, except that like, it's an, it's kind of an act, I think. But per, per, I mean, to get to your point, well, no, but 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 and that is that is the thing, right? So it's like there's a limited number of perspectives you're getting in the U.S. media, and and what you're saying, Cleo, about India, it's like it's totally different. Like it's not even the same conversation. I mm -hmm. mean, how much have we heard about uh, what's happening to people in Afghanistan after the U.S. pulled out? It's almost nothing. It's yeah. it's barely in it's barely on the left or the right in the U.S. media. So just, yeah, just, it's interesting how the whole conversation can be so different. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and so what I, what I'm hearing out of the rest of the world is, is larger or rest of the world. I mean, you know, India and I try to watch some places in Africa and the Middle East also just to triangulate is the discussion is broader in time and space. So the, uh, it, it's not so much this kind of almost tactical um, discussion about this theater was bombed or, you know, that hospital was bombed. It's, uh, it's more what has the behavior of the countries involved been over the past 10, 20, 30, 50 years. 
and what do you think it'll be going forward? And what does that mean in other theaters as well, including, especially in the case of India, the Indo-Pacific? So there's uh, it, it's it's there's the there is some tactical uh, assessment because they do have the Indian media has journalists on the ground in Ukraine, uh, but at the same time there's this larger attempt to position this within longer trend lines and their analysis of those longer trend lines are also very different than what we're used to. Um, and you know, so, so they'll bring up examples from uh, Russia or Putin backing Assad in Syria and, and say, look that he, this guy's not going to back down. You know, we, we were told that by, the U.S. and others, that the Russians would crumble in Syria. They didn't. They backed Assad in ways that the U.S. didn't back Gaddafi and uh, um, other horrible people. Um, you know, and they'll bring up things like the doctor, the U.S., the doctor that gave the location of Osama bin Laden to the Americans, uh, the Pakistan doctor. Do you know where he is now? Uh, alive and happy. Yeah, he's he's in a Pakistan jail, being tortured on a regular basis. The Indians mm-hmm. know that. The Americans, it it, it it didn't get reported, and it was never uh, part of any negotiation, apparently, or successful negotiation with Pakistan to get this guy out. So, uh, it, it all of those data points you can you can select positive and negative for any country you want all the time. Uh, but these negative data points about the West are being pulled out more frequently now um, mm. in discussions around the way forward and how to handle this war in places like India. And it's, it's a real problem. Uh, and especially because there's very much starting to be a, uh, an ethnicity component to it. You know, this is a, this is a, they only, the West is only caring about the Ukrainians because they're white. Now that is a a message that I'm sure China would love to spread far and wide to every country it engages with. Um, It's Mm -hmm. a, it's a poison, real poison. And there's a lot of footage and, and context, all of those, da- those data points you can pull out. You can pull out data points that counter it, but you can also pull out a lot of data points that support it, and those are the ones that seem to be getting pulled out now. Well, this is interesting. Like, what, what can be done about this issue? Because like, that's not even the conversation in the U.S. right now. No one, no one seems to be aware that like, this, this whole uh, political warfare thing on this topic is even happening, mainly because I think the way Americans consume media, it's, you know, everything gets wiped down the memory hole. People are only focused on like whatever the controversy of today is. Nobody remembers the previous thing, which sounds very different from how, you know, you're describing Indian media, for example, that can actually talk about things over, uh, you know, decades of time. Yeah. I mean, this gets to some really fundamental issues around education systems and things like most, most, most Asian countries, and I would exclude communist run China from this, uh, have very long, reasonably accurate memories and learn a lot about the history of their country. And, you know, most the, the average Indian may not know as much about their history as they want, but they can tell you a lot about their history. Um, and civics and, you know, Republic day, which is the big, one of the big holidays is their is their constitution, the day their constitution came into being, and you know there's a lot more I'd say awareness of the civil state, higher voting turnout, that sort of thing. Um, the the U.S. is 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 the edu- there are problems in the education system, and um, you had on Commander uh, Paul Giara recently, and he gave beautiful and important overview of maritime strategic issues, which uh, I I learned a lot from, and I I shouldn't have learned a lot from. I should have known it. I should have been taught that. Uh, And then he could start from that base and then build up from there. 
So, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure why, as he brought up, for example, more people don't know about the importance of the Navy. And if you don't know about the importance of the Navy, then you don't fund it properly and you don't know what you need and you, and you don't understand why hard power is important and all those sorts of things. So the, these are, again, we've got this tiny little tragic tip of an iceberg, which is Ukraine, but below it are, are all of these other problems that, um, that are creating an instability in the system that others, for example, China can take uh, very good advantage from f- through political warfare. Well, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm completely bored right now. I need to go on TikTok and watch some 30-second <laughs> videos. I, I was just thinking that the real solution to this is me going to the mountains and retiring and writing poetry. Oh, like a Chinese... Like, like a Chinese a... scholar at the end of the dynasties, right? Like, what am I going to do? I that's, guess just... that's interesting. You took it as like, I give up. And I took it as like, we got to burn down TikTok. Get oh. all the kids off the social media. Well, I thought you you were giving up in a smaller micro sense like no no, no i'm I need, saying that i need that, to to distract myself look, no it was a joke giving about, up in our own ways. no 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 it's it's a joke about how like the problem is like people have such short attention spans they're so they they crave immediate pleasures so much that like they're not willing to put in work to well, actually i mean i don't know base. like I, I, the thing is though that like america has been so successful for so long in a lot of ways that we just don't have, like, it just is not in the worldview that, like, there could be... What's what's that saying? Good times create decadent men, decadent men create something. I don't think, well, I think it's weak. I think it's weak men. men something. something like that. Yeah. We're, we're obviously should have learned that men. in school. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I think that there is this whole thing where, you know, we don't even... Because no country wants to talk about war or like what you were talking about clear like hard power like what is the use of hard power like that's not something you learn in school because it's almost seen as we're the strongest country in the world it would be mm, unseemly almost like for us to talk about you know well also when there is the message in the educational system that the u.s was founded by white supremacists oh yeah and... yeah we're also ter- bad that's yeah, the other part right. of it we're the strongest country in the world and we're also bad so who are we to tell other countries or like try to why does america think it should be the police of the world that right. kind of thing well yeah. i mean and, and let me let me just add one more sort of complexity to that which is that... sorry i'm going back on tiktok i'm bored thanks chris <laughs> well, it's like People think the point of the military is to wage war when the point of the military is to ensure peace. Uh, But because of America's, I would say, uh, bad behavior over the last few decades uh, in terms of waging war with the military, it's easy to then, based on real evidence, equate U.S military buildup with waging war rather than the, what I think is the original purpose is to, uh, you know, to, to maintain peace. And that's sort of, you know, the founding fathers looked at the military as like, you know, the point of a militia, the point of a military is to, is to maintain peace, to defend yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's a, Actually, a very good point. Right. I'm glad it, it, I stopped the TikTok. And to and, to and it. what you're referencing, Cleo, with the, what Paul Giara had said uh, on the previous podcast was that, like, the point of the Navy is to ensure, I mean, among others, to ensure international trade, to ensure that no other country, say China, can block or uh, tax, et cetera, uh, this, this, these maritime routes. And so the, the Navy serves that purpose. Uh, and it's not there to, you know, go shoot someone. It's there to just kind of protect. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. So first of all, before you go to TikTok or go to the mountain, I'd say that if, you, if you're concerned about this and you want to fight this, you're doing exactly what you need to do. You're uh, talking to people and trying to figure it out and um, and creating a, 
a venue where we can have these discussions. So I'm very grateful you're you're neither posting your incredible dancing skills, Chris, or writing your uh, beautiful iambic pentameter, Matt. Uh, and and your oh no, book. my poetry sucks. <laughs> <laughs> But go on. Well, <laughs> yes. Don't interrupt her. She's praising us. Yeah. <laughs> However, I'm sure his dancing is wonderful, and uh, and 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 Shelley is of course anchoring it all to stay with the, the nautical theme. Um, but we're, you know, we're we're actually the so the the counter argument, not the counter argument, but the colliery to uh, what Commander Jarrah said was that yes, you can use a navy you need to use the Navy to protect trade. Uh, but the concern has sometimes been that it is to protect your trade to the detriment of, of other countries. And there's always been that kind of that tension with the Royal Navy with it was an issue with the British and others as well. Um, but we were entering a period of, where the a free and open Indo-Pacific was not dependent on one country, but it was burden shared among for, for example, I think the idea of one of it was the Quad, uh, but also other countries. And so you actually did have a situation where uh, you you had multiple navies coming together for global trade under the aegis of a free and open Indo-Pacific. So it got around that problem of, uh, of the detractors who would say, well, strong American navy just means that it's U.S. control of the trade routes. Um, so... Uh, but you, 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 you would still have that U S insurance, but you have these other countries that are coming into it as well, who believe the same things you do and who are willing to put their ships where their, where their mouths are. And that was very promising, but what this is, what this Ukraine situation is, is potentially doing is, is really damaging to that as well. The more we understand why certain things were in place, why the navies are important, we can understand what parts of it we should be building up and what parts uh, we should be protecting. But it's not, it's, it's a, we're, we're at an extremely complex, potentially turning point. And the, the wider the lens is in the decision making, the um, the more likely we are to avoid some some things that are that are really really bad. I mean, you know, the in, Indian strategists who I've heard take Putin at his word when he says he's willing to use tactical nukes. You know, that's a whole other thing. Um, so we are in danger. And uh, the more we can understand not the areas where we disagree with allies, but the areas where we can work with allies to create stability in other parts of the world, the better off we'll be. Well, this is definitely one of my frustrations. I see so many Americans get caught up in just like these small wedge issues they have with each other. And it's like, you know, we are in a cold war and, you know, the liberal democratic world order could burn down then that's, that's a, such a bigger issue. And like, I, I don't think people are even, many people aren't even aware of like what is at stake that, you know, the, the world as we know it could change forever for the worse. Yeah. And I, I hear a level of concern and urgency in the, in the Indian discussion and, the, and in the Japanese discussion and some other locations as well. That I that I wasn't hearing even during COVID or Galwan or you know and any of those more uh, overt things and and a big component of it is this is the economic warfare component of it partially because the global economy is destroyed or very or very weakened because of COVID and you know the, the idea that you can sanction China in the way that you can sanction Russia, you, you can target individuals, which would be great. It would be wonderful to have public information about the international holdings of 
the top 5,000 or 100 people in the Chinese Communist Party. That would be very helpful. Uh, but the U.S. Has, did, has not successfully shifted its pharmaceutical supply chains, including raw materials out of China or rare earths out of China. You know, th- these are not, this isn't, this isn't Russia. And if China decides to seize enemy assets, if the U.S. says we're going to sanction China and China says, fine, everything that's in China now belongs to China, uh, that's, that's a, a lever that the, that the Russians can't pull. So, and this, this is something that you've talked about a lot, but a, a key component has to be decoupling from China or deparasiting from China, as, as we've discussed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's one thing, like if, if I were the president, one thing I would do is get the CEOs of like, you know, the top hundred companies and meet with them and, and say, look, guys, you know, you've got six months or a year or, or, you know, maybe two years to pull all your manufacturing out of China. And this is not a threat. This is me giving you advice. Like, here's your timeline, but I don't know how long it's really going to be. Uh, if you don't follow my very strong advice right now to move out of China, you will be screwed later. I just don't know when or under what circumstances. And if you try to lobby me, then I'm not going to listen to you. Well, there's going to be another guy in four years. Well, that's, I mean. And you're not going to be president. Well, I I would definitely not be president for a second term if I acted like that. But, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'd get elected in the first place. I mean, but I do think, I don't know if they would listen. I'm just thinking about all those reports of um, even during the Trump administration when Trump was pretty clearly uh, concerned about China and the economics of and trade. And then you had these stories coming out about all these Wall Street CEOs and stuff trying to essentially pressure the Trump administration to ease easing off. Right. I mean, but also like like the Trump administration ended up during COVID, like needing to work with these companies in particular, he ended up tr- having to work with these big pharmaceutical industries to get them to produce the vaccine on the timeline that he wanted which was before the election, right? And so like, had he totally alienated uh, Pfizer and Moderna and, you know, whatever, like it would have been much harder for him to get the vaccine. So I, I understand like there's, there's no like pure right way or pure wrong way. Like everything's going to have some good and bad consequences, but like you still need to get American companies out of China at some point, because at some point, they're going to be out of China anyway. It's only a matter of whether we're doing it on our terms or whether it's being done in the Chinese Communist Party's terms. At some point, almost certainly, the Chinese Communist Party will nationalize whatever's still in China. They will cut off trade uh, and they will do it on their terms. So we better make sure that the impact of that is minimal like it is for Russia uh, versus maximal putting us into a severe depression in the US. I think so. This is a this is a really important conversation uh, about how to do it, and it's it's for me it's useful to look at Chinese stated tactics and strategies. So, for example, the three warfares: yeah, you know, psychological warfare, media warfare, and lawfare. So we know that they're targeting us with that, and we saw it, for example, in this specific. Kind of context around WeChat. So after after the uh, Chinese attacked the Indians and twenty Indian soldiers died, uh, one of, within two weeks the Indians had banned fifty nine Chinese apps, including WeChat. And there was discussion in the U.S. about banning WeChat and TikTok. And in the case of WeChat, some grassroots WeChat users group popped up and brought uh, brought the case to court saying it was an imposition, I think, on their First Amendment rights. And long story short, they used lawfare to protect WeChat. And in the end, I think the American government even paid out like a million, paid out their legal fees, like a million dollars or something like that. So in this, so 
understanding that, first of all, you know where to defend. So even if you're telling a company, don't invest, you can expect there'll be attempts in the media to present that as uh, whatever, whatever argument we'll use. There'll be a psychological attack on, you know, oh, this is, uh, you're conflating the Chinese people with the government and all that sort of stuff. And there'll be a lawfare attack. So you need to bolster the defenses, those defenses. And I would argue at the same time, China has just told you what their vulnerabilities are. They're vulnerable to psychological, uh, legal, and media attacks. So maybe do that. And uh, you also had um, where Montley Lari on, and he's done a very interesting study on, if you look at the Unrestricted Warfare book, they, they talk about, I think it's 24 different warfares. Well, we should be defending in each of those categories and figuring out strategies to attack them because if they've identified those as points of attack, they mean they're points of weakness for the Chinese, for the Chinese Communist Party. And similarly, just at a kind of societal level, if you look at who the Chinese Communist Party attacks within China, uh, it, it tends, tends to fall into three broad categories. Uh, people who, who, for whom faith is important, family is important, and freedoms are important, family in the context of sort of community, right? And, but we saw this also with the one-child policy. Those, those three things, faith, family, and freedom, are existential threats to the party because faith and family gives an individual a sense of identity and security that is outside of the party remit. And freedom, of course, undermines the control of the party fundamentally. So if you, if you want to figure out who to support and who to um, give more space to uh, in order to undermine the legitimacy and operational viability of the Chinese Communist Party in other places around the world. Those are, those are three groupings that are in a direct line of assault for the Chinese Communist Party. And you can see it, for example, in the, in the Solomon Islands, where uh, when Premier Sudani of Malaita province said he didn't want any Chinese Communist uh, Party companies operating in Malaita, and there was the Aoki communique in the communique, it gives as one of its reasons for not wanting that, the fact that China is an atheist state and it is antithetical to freedom of religion and they are uh, devout Christians and they think that working with the Chinese Communist Party gives strength to an organization that wants to destroy something that is a core part of their own identity. So, yes, you know, we can identify uh, these, these lines of, of attack, uh, but the ideal thing, you know, if, you, if you're talking about banning companies, for example, is to put that into a larger conference of national power context and figure out how to flip that on its head and use that to push back against the party. Well, so that does sound very important and good, but don't you think we should, it's more important for us to talk about whether Joe Rogan is a racist? So, so what would be important to know is what uh, Chinese PLA-backed mass customized manipulation is happening online to make us have that discussion. Hmm. They're controlling the narrative. There, well, there is an... an attempt to create division, right? They don't even, in many cases, they don't even care that much about the narrative. They don't care whether you're pro-vax or anti-vax, but they want you at each other's throats. They want to create division, which creates weakness in the society so that uh, mutes your ability to respond or even focus on, on them. I think that's really important for people watching to know, because we all get caught up in these, you know, kind of wedge issues. And like, we feel that like, oh, I'm like really mad at this person. And if you like take a moment to like breathe, you need to identify that that is your emotional state being manipulated and, you know, focus on the larger issue of like, you know, we shouldn't be trying to tear each other apart. We need to work together. So it's, it's, it's tricky because successful political warfare builds off of a kernel of truth, right? Mm -hmm. So, and so then it becomes very difficult to disaggregate. So you, you, you have, you know, the, the legitimate, um, ship, you know, of 
of issues, but then you've got all these barnacles on it that are slowing it down and deviating the path and all that sort of stuff. This is a very failed attempt to impress uh, uh, Commander Jarrah with a nautical uh, example. But the point is, um, just because something is something that you care deeply about doesn't mean it's not legitimate. Uh, and in, in many cases, what what Chinese political warfare will do is take a legitimate grievance amplify the grievance, but then push the solution in a direction that is not necessarily going to achieve the outcome that you want it to achieve, but an outcome that they want it to achieve, which is more uh, division and incongruence within the society. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's certainly been the case with like, I mean, I guess the hot button issue in the US for the last two years has been racism. And like, they're taking something real, which I mean, racism is a real thing, and amplifying it to the point where everyone is at each other's throats about racism or, or like unconscious racism. You're racist whether you recognize that you're racist or if you don't recognize it, you're also racist. And making this like the forefront of the issue rather than how do we treat everyone with kindness as fellow Americans and work to, to treat everyone well you know, like, but it, but it always has to come back to the thing that that makes people the most upset. And that's also interesting because that particular framing, it, it, I, I was reminded of when we were talking about how sort of, you know, the third world is viewing the Ukrainian crisis as, oh, this is white people defending white people. That those, that message of racism that, there is that also- That is something I have seen on Twitter. Yeah. From like white people in America saying that like, we're just, we just care about Ukraine because we're racist. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that there's probably other factors uh, why Ukraine is important, such as its location between Russia and the rest of Europe and the NATO thing. And yeah. And, and it's an independent country that, that has been invaded by. <laughs> right. But I mean, like, I, I think, I think when, you know, if, the CCP attacks Taiwan and the US comes to Taiwan's aid, then they'll have to, there'll be a different narrative, right? It won't be racist because most people in Taiwan don't look like most people in the US. So obviously they can't be like, oh, it's America defending other white people, but there will be some other spin. Uh, well, right? like when they attacked Hong Kong protesters in London uh, and called them like racist against China. Wait, the Hong Kongers were racist? Yeah, there was like, a few months ago in London, there were these counter protesters, like the CCP counter protesters to the Hong Kong protests, and they beat up a bunch of like the Hong Kong protesters. For but they being had but they, they were, had these they were... banners that were like anti racist banners, basically, because they were saying that people were being racist against China. So what what is race? What is race? Whatever you want it to be. Well, I mean, when you were talking about racial divisions in the U.S., like. The Chinese Communist Party has clearly used the like whole anti-Asian hate thing to be like to equate that with criticizing the Chinese government. Right. But I mean, Hong Kongers being racist against China, Chinese, I, like like that's obviously pushing it to, to like what should be seen as ludicrous. I mean, I'm pretty sure that message was also for the white people, the white British people, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, it'll, and, and an interesting thing about the Taiwan discussion is that when people, sometimes when you hear people discussing about why it would be bad if Taiwan was invaded, they talk about microchips, uh, not about, you know, 25 or 6 million democratic free people being subject to the Chinese Communist Party violent invasion and subjection. So... Uh, it, it takes it a, away from the that clearly bad uh, human tragedy component to it and reduces it to a, a supply chain issue. Right. And, and, and of course, the, the, the real issue, which is the, uh, you know, Taiwanese beef hot pot. Oh, yeah. I knew you were going to take it there. Uh, well, this it's like you were saying earlier with, with Taiwan, we are much more um, in bed with China than we are Russia, particularly in the U.S. And I know, Shelley, this is something you've brought up. Like in the case of Russia invading Ukraine, people have been like, it's it's OK to spend a few more dollars to you know stand up for Ukraine. But if China invades Taiwan, 
Are people going to be saying the same thing? I don't know. It, it's not because it's not just going to be like a few more dollars a gallon in gas, which, by the way, are, is already a lot for a lot of Americans. So I don't want to downplay that in any way. Also, gas was up for other reasons besides Putin. Right. Like, like it's the gas prices are are really unfair to the most marginalized people. But it's like Cleo was saying, there won't but, be but, medicine. But, but it won't be. Yeah, it, it won't be gas. It'll be. There's no medicine. There's no like you know, you know, literally no screws and bolts to build anything. Uh, there's no electronic components to wire your whatever. You can't buy phone chargers. Like, like the, the basic things that we need to survive in this country have been outsourced to China. The iPhones to watch TikTok, which TikTok already belongs to China. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're in big trouble. So we we better, like I said, if if I were president, which is never going to happen and probably shouldn't, um, I would try to get these American companies to pull out of China. But as you as you point out, Cleo, it's you got to do a lot of other things first before you can convince these companies that they got to pull out. Yeah, you have to cr create the environment where it's viable, and also there are a range of implicit threats that if, if it gets to the point of and, and we'll see what the Russians will do. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we, so far, the from a Russian perspective, they're fighting a proxy war. I mean, that's the that's what the Russian that's what Putin said was you know, economic warfare is warfare, and but they haven't gone after, as far as I know, gone after the grid or uh, comms or anything like that, and I. I'm not sure. I'm not sure why uh, they they may not want to escalate it like that. But I suspect if China, I suspect China would do it a lot quicker. They'd be a lot faster off the off the mark to do it. And we saw when uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo met with uh, President Tsai, there was that power outage, mm. and. There was a power outage on the Mumbai electrical grid also uh, not, not long after Galwan. And if that is a demonstration of capabilities, uh, then I think that's, a, you know, we could, you could expect that domestically. So you'd have all of those high prices and supply chain issues, but you, you might potentially also have these rolling grid issues or water supply or we're not secure. And you know, the Western uh, infrastructure is is definitely not secure. And and another thing about Taiwan, which is I'd be interested to know what you think, because uh, it's often been presented as one of the advantages Taiwan has is that it, unlike Ukraine, it's eighty miles off the coast, and so that gives it a, a bit of a buffer. But I'm wondering if from a, a comms perspective and stuff, that actually means it might be much easier to cut off. If they cut off all of the cables that lead into Taiwan and um, disable the satellite, it might be much easier. I, I, I don't I don't know. I'm just, this is just a lot logic, but, lo but logic based on incomplete facts. I'm wondering if it might be easier to cut off quickly. And yes, it's harder for the PLA to get there, but it's also harder for reinforcements to get there. So in the case of Ukraine, what you're seeing is, you know, things can get brought up to the Polish border, or up to the Hungarian or Romania or whatever border, all the other borders that can then get into Ukraine if necessary. But in the case of Taiwan, as it's an island, it might be much more difficult to resupply. That, that's a great point because, you know, a lot of the invasion of Ukraine has also been a narrative battle, which at least in the U.S., it seems like Putin has been losing that war because, you know, we're able to get footage of, you know, the maternity ward that they have bombed. Uh, we There are reporters inside of uh, Ukraine. But if China is able to successfully cut off the internet from Taiwan, and if there aren't a bunch of, you know, reporters headed in there, there's just a lot people won't see or know. On top of that, you'll have people abroad arguing that, oh, it's not, this is not a fight worth having. It's so small, yeah. And if you don't see the, you know, the the maternity wards in Taiwan being blown up, that uh, could yeah. be effective. I mean, I think that, well, I mean, I'm thinking about China, the Chinese Communist Party basically cutting off the internet in Xinjiang yeah. for like a year uh, back in 2009 when there was the 
the the unrest that happened there. So I they, I mean I'm sure they would try to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I mean I, I don't I don't know exactly the the physical uh, layout of the Taiwan undersea internet cables, and they probably connect to more than one place. But yeah, I can definitely see a scenario where cutting them off from the internet would be terrifying. Uh, and this is something uh, you know that that we had brought up with Commander GR, which is that you know if China targets U.S. comms, whether it's the comms that the the Navy is using internally or uh, other types of U.S. satellite communications, whether you know GPS or something, I wouldn't even know how to drive to the grocery store, right? Like, like what what backups do we have? Uh, whether it's for Taiwan or internally, to to deal with losing communications in literally the most connected era in known human history? Good question, Matt. Um, so we've seen a little bit um, how how this can happen accidentally with the uh, volcano and earthquake and tsunami that happened in Tonga. And Tonga got completely cut off. And um, so there was a scramble, and this is actually the second time Tonga's cable was cut. It, a, a ship, it seems like, dragged an anchor and cut it also a couple of years ago. Um, and, and we, and redundancies weren't put in place then. And people were, uh, scrambling about how to reestablish connections. And, and, uh, Elon Musk did end up sending some Starlink terminals, but as he said about the star Starlink terminals in Ukraine, be very careful using them because they can be located and targeted. Um, so the question is, is there a, a redundant communication system? And it's something I've looked at a little bit in the context of the uh, Pacific Islands, because that is the strategic front line between Asia and the Americas. And there's a lot of ocean and not a lot of land points. And if the satellites are blinded and the cables are cut, uh, being able to communicate across that vast area, it's like one sixth of the planet, is going to be very important. And one of the things that came up during the Tonga issue was looking back at some of these uh, older technologies like ham radios uh, and whether that could be uh, an effective redundancy system. And somebody uh, I spoke with in the UK also said that there were, they had systems that were designed to operate in the case of a, of a nuclear explosion, which would have the effect of a massive uh, electromagnetic pulse, which would knock out a lot of other communications. So we have these, these older systems that may be able to withstand that kind of disruption. And I would be very surprised if this hasn't been gamed out by Beijing. And when you look at some of the embassies that China has in the Pacific Islands, they have, until they get covered up, uh, but sometimes they're visible, very complex communications arrays. And they have communication ships, class of ships, which are surveillance ships, which they have floating around the region, uh, which may have the capability to relay signals. I'm not sure. Um, so I think that they have certainly factored into their calculations that satellites may become inoperable and are going to other systems as redundancies. And we don't even seem to have done it in the case of humanitarian assistance and disaster response. I mean, after the Tonga situation, there should be an, an evaluation for all of the Pacific islands of perhaps ham radios or, or some sort of redundant system that can, can be maintained for disaster response at least, but also in case of the, these, um, these, cataclysmic kinetic events. And if anybody wants to put in the comments uh, some of these older systems that we can look up and uh, figure out whether they would work, I'd be uh, uh, very grateful because um, I, I, I know the bad guys are looking at it and I think we should be talking about it a little bit more openly as well.
Wow, that's. Uh... I suddenly have an urge to buy a shortwave radio. <laughs> I was also thinking that exactly. <laughs> it reminds me actually a lot of uh, the, the newer Battlestar Galactica. Uh, never mind. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm I, that I only watched one season of it. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, and, but and hey, on the bright. Carry your pigeons, you know, just in case. And then if things go bad, you can always eat them. I don't, I don't think there point. are carrier pigeons left that are like trained, right? Aren't yeah, they no, they still of... exist. Like it's like a hobby for some people. Yeah. And they'll become like the, the linchpin of national security if this goes down. But on the bright side, if China cuts off the internet, you know, at least that racist Joe Rogan won't have a platform to spread medical misinformation. We'll have to adopt the clacking system or whatever it's called from Terry Pratchett. I, I approve. Yeah. I support yeah. that one. That's a, yeah. Oh, is that where they hold up the thing, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, you see like on the different towers. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to watch uh, out for vampires. <laughs> that's that's true. Yeah. Wow, I have no idea what this reference. Uh, well, well. Anyways, um, I mean, I think this has been you know one maybe one of our most important and darkest podcasts. Yeah, but but also there are so many topics that we wanted to talk with you about that we have not covered. Like we had discussed over email talking about the you know geostrategic implications of the Pacific Islands, and we've touched on that for like five minutes, and there's at least an hour to go into. But I think. We're going to have to actually save that for a future podcast. This was very good, like big picture thing. I mean, yeah. like right from the beginning, like when like the India thing went in a totally different direction than I was expecting. It's like, oh, this is good. This is, this is going to be big. So, so while you were, while, while, while I was talking about the India stuff, what, what came to your mind about how to handle the situation? Uh, gosh, I don't know if we ever offer solutions. Yeah. I mean, our solution show. is to interview really, really smart people. Um, um, sorry, so sorry, sorry to disappoint. Yeah. I mean, you, you never disappoint, Cleo. Yeah. It's usually because I can bring gifts, you know, like uh, maple syrup, right? Like to, yeah, well, actually, to the them. theme through all of it was the main issue is, in a lot of ways, the Chinese Communist Party. And like, if that is the focus uh, globally, that, that will solve a lot of problems. Well, I think that like one thing, one big thing is to not like get tricked again by their whole, like, we can help mediate between Russia and Ukraine. Fool me twice. Can't get fooled again. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, there's also the question of whether Russia would be willing to let China mediate for them because it would put them in a subservient, like, subservient place position. China. But, like, you know, don't fall for it again. But also I think there's, like... The communication, the, there could be better, like a communication issue that we could solve with the India thing, right? Like, do you, I think so? Do does the Biden administration understand what's happening? Um, are they talking? Like, what is going on there in terms of our um, conversations with India? It seems like the Biden administration and Europe are doing a good job of connecting with each other, but if we're just talking to India in a way where we're not really um, acknowledging their concerns or their viewpoint, and we're just trying to kind of get them to do what we want them yeah. to do. Well, this, this is, that's an interesting point because, you know, one of the things that Trump administration was very good at was reaching out to allies, not really European allies, but India, a lot of the places in the Pacific that we didn't really get a chance to go into. But, you know, he was criticized as being, you know, not working with allies. Biden promised to work with allies, and he's doing that largely with Europe, but I don't know how much has been really going on with all the the other countries like yeah, India. And, yeah, and and so just to just to follow up on this "don't get fooled again" thing, uh, the other component of the "don't get fooled again" thing is, I mean, the one is can China mediate? The other is this is the, everybody has to look at Russia as the threat now and not China, mm. right? And and this is. Uh, very similar to what happened around 9-11. I mean, there was starting to be discussion about China at that time. And then there's that horrific attack on the U.S. and, and the entire focus pivoted. And the U.S. can, you know, we, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. We can be very concerned about terrorism and very concerned about China. And we can be very concerned about Russia and very concerned about China. So that's another component of this don't get fooled again thing is they're not going to, they have no credibility as a mediator, obviously. They're part of the bankrolling of the whole thing. Uh, but also 
they are creating, the Chinese Communist Party is creating systemic, if you want to go that way, uh, problems that are destroying us as a society, as an economy, as a legitimate political um, entity in the world. Uh, so in, unless that is addressed, everything else needs to be addressed also, but unless that is addressed, that problem is still going to be there. Well, I was going to say, in terms of the 9-11 thing, part of the whole thing was we wanted to get China on our side for the war on terror, right? And they, and they did pretend to join us so then they could use terrorism to go after their own, you know, Muslim population. But they also continued to back Pakistan in, in using terrorism against India. So I think the solution here is to look at this. It's kind of like the original Mario Brothers, right? It's like, you know... You're 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 you're, you're playing. This. You're 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 you know jumping over these bad guys and avoiding bullets, and you get to the you know level one four, and it's like the castle, and you you beat the bad guy, and then you realize, oh no, the princess is in another castle, <laughs> and you and you go through, and it's like level two, the princess is in another castle. Oh man, what you should do is just warp, and then warp again till you get to the final world, and you realize that the final big bad is the Chinese Communist Party. So just go right to the end, target the big bad, you know, destroy Bowser and rescue the princess. Who's the princess in this scenario? Uh, freedom. World peace. Who's, yeah. No, freedom. Freedom is the right one. Lady Liberty. Lady Liberty. <laughs> there we go. Uh, okay. It would have been so smooth if I had come up with that. <laughs> no, no, no. This is totally, this is totally on brand. <laughs> to get almost to the end and then fumble. Uh, that's what, how we end all our podcasts. We're doing pretty well. And then we so yeah, like, collapse. Batting 100 at batting zero. Uh, yeah. I, but like I now have this a like. a thousand. You bat a thousand. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's a slam dunk. <laughs> um I, I now have this like mental image though of like she and Putin meeting February 4th right before the Olympics and Putin confiding in his best friend Xi Jinping that he really wants to, you know, invade Ukraine and then Xi Jinping kind of egging him on. Like, oh, it's a great idea for you to invade Ukraine. Uh, you know, yeah, you you got you got this, you know. I was imagining the two of them in Bowser's castle. <laughs> uh so, guys, Cleo yeah. is still here. <laughs> I'll just Cleo. let myself out. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us, Cleo. That that was that was well. I mean, it's the kind of information that we like to have on on the show that is not information most people are getting from the major corporate media. I thought, thought you're going to end with not information. <laughs> and I was like, oh, yeah, sorry, I did what? my best. Yeah. No, that was great information. It was not information. You, I see. I see. I see. Yes. I see. Yes. <laughs> You did great, Cleo. And, and we'll have to have you on again to cover all the things that we didn't actually get around to. Yeah, China's about to expand its sphere of influence almost to the coast of Hawaii. So we should probably talk about that at some okay. point. Well, do, do we have another like hour? <laughs> Next time on China Unscripted, the Chinese Communist Party is trying to expand its influence all the way to the American border. Build that wall. Well, <laughs> and the ocean. Like, but of course, with Guam... Matt, they're already there. Oh, man. Ooh. All right. We, we, we got to save this for another <laughs> podcast. But we'll save there's, that. There's going to be a lot. So we'll have you back on soon. <laughs> yeah. Thanks again, Cleo. Okay, bye. Well, I think Cleo had a lot of really good information on this podcast. Uh, just, that's why we keep having her on again and again. That's right. I mean, I think it's very important for, you know, the people watching this to like really try and share this with, with, with people because, you know, as we kind of talked about... There are huge global security issues happening, and, and a lot of people just aren't really aware of what's at stake. But we did are you hear trouble. that the Kardashians are back together? Like they're a thing again? What about Pete Davidson? Yeah. <laughs> mm, celebrities <laughs> unexposed. Yeah, that's what needs to happen. Well, if I could remember that saying about, you know, good, good, good times, times make weak men. And then there's like, what happens after that? The doom. <laughs> but then strong well, men make yeah. good times. So we're almost there. No, hard times make strong men. Strong men make good times. 
yeah. good times make weak men and then doom. That's no, it. I think then weak men make bad. Uh, yeah. Well, the point it, is we're, we're, we're almost to the hard times. And then someone we're can save us and make us. almost to the hard times. Oh, I mean, I think the Cleo is painting a picture of like much, much harder times. That's yeah. true. I mean, gas is already like above seven a gallon. Actually, oil fell below $100 again a but, barrel. But gas prices are still high. So and anyway. ain't that a gas. So thank you for joining us on this episode of China Unscripted. Uh, yeah, this I think was a very important one. I, I learned a lot. So once again, I'm Chris Chappell. I'm Shelley Zhang. And I'm Matt Ganesha. We'll see you next time.